Um, I actually just muted everyone. It's not because I don't love you all, uh, but it's just really hard to talk over everybody. Um, thank you so much for being here. Really excited that we get to spend some time together, even though it's not face to face um, in person. We still get to see all of you, most of you, um, and celebrate with you. And so I'm so thankful that we have um, technology where we can still do this and celebrate with the Family Promise community. So, so excited that you're here. Um, I'm just gonna give you a quick layout for the evening. Um, I'm going to start off by just giving you a quick uh, kind of state of the organization of where we're at, what we're doing, and what we're looking forward to be doing in the future. Um, and then one of our board members, Lori Eastman, um, who is a social worker um, for Providence, she'll give you a little bit more of her background. She's going to come on and do a training for us, a short training on uh, mandated reporting for child abuse, um, something that we really are going to emphasize in the coming years for our volunteers, making sure that we're all equipped and feeling um, empowered to do our roles well. And then um, Samantha, our children's and volunteer uh, coordinator will come in at the end um, of the evening to kind of give you a little bit of a recap of what she's been doing with the children here. Um, and then she just has some stuff to share through that. So um, in the chat box, if you have questions throughout this uh, presentation, whether it's through what I'm presenting or probably you'll have more questions when Lori's presenting, um, put it in the chat box so that we have that, um, because then if we don't have time to get to it, um, then we'll at least be able to respond to you later. Um, so we'll save everything in the chat box, we'll put it up on our website and we'll email it out to everyone that uh, attended here. So um, yeah, so while we're going through this, if you could just try to, uh, if you can stay muted just because the background noise does get uh, a little bit much when several people are unmuted. So. Um, I'm just going to, there's some new people that joined in, so I'm going to mute everyone one more time. Um, all right, so for all of you people that minimized my screen, that's what we're going to be focusing on now. <laughs> um, so if you want to pull that back up, and we're just going to kind of go through a little bit of where Family Promise of the South Bay is at right now. Um, so here we go. Starting in 2019, so I want to look back a little bit on all the work that you did in the past year. I just came in September, um, and so the majority of this work, you all did. And so I really want to celebrate that because it's so incredible the amount of time, energy, and effort, and love that the Family Promise South Bay community has put into serving these families. So I just wanted to take a minute, if you didn't get our annual report, to kind of look back. Um, last year was by far... Uh, the best year that Family Promise has had in serving families. As you can see within our hospitality network in the rotation um, at the different congregations that we partner with, we were able to serve 16 families in 2019. Um, if you look at the previous years, uh, yeah, that's incredible. The amount, of, the amount of families that you all were able to help find stable uh, shelter is incredible. And right now it's a silent clap, but can we just give a hand for Karen and Sherry and the rest of the board for keeping this thing rolling um, in between EDs. It's really incredible the work that they were able to do in 2019. And thank you to all of you for your commitment and your donations and everything that kept us going. It was incredible. So thank you so much. Um, and what's even more incredible is right now, um, and actually two weeks ago, I couldn't say this, but now, uh, even with everything that's going on, all the families that we have worked with, the ones that are still in communication with us, 100% of them are housed. Last week, that wasn't true, but the family that did lose their housing, we were able to find permanent housing for them again. So now we're back to 100%, which is so incredible. Um, it's much higher than the um, national average, and it's way higher than the LA County average for housing. So good job on just creating a community for these families. So impressed by that. Um, and I don't know if you know this, some of you don't because most of you are involved with our rotation, um, but we do transitional housing and we also have a family advocacy program and a referral network where we work with different organizations in the South Bay. And through that network, we were able to serve over 300 families last year. Um, and this year will probably be even higher. And so the continued effort that you all have, the connections that you've created for us have allowed us to continue to serve so many families and obviously this all comes down to your support um, this pie chart is kind of hard to see but that big green area that's the in-kind and volunteer value of support that we've gotten because of all of you um, the other the other little triangles those pieces of the pie those are money that you've donated to so you've definitely contributed there but that huge green spot is what you all contribute with your time with your in-kind donations and with just all the things that you give because of your skills, your gifts, 
um, and your community. So that is incredible. And that is how we do what we do because of all of you. So thank you so much. Um, I would love for you guys to give you yourselves a huge hand right now for all the work that you do. Good job. Thank you so much. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about right now. Um, I know we're all in this very strange time, something that none of us have experienced before. I just got off the phone with my grandma, um, you know, who's lived through almost everything, and we finally get to bond over something new together. Unfortunately, it's a pandemic, but, um, but we're all going through something new together, and so I want to update you as a community of Family Promise um, what this looks like right now for us, um, and so for us, we are still sheltering and caring for our families. And I just want to give a huge shout out to First Christian Church um, in Torrance. They have provided the space and the opportunity for us to continue to house these families. So we still are full. Um, we have four families here um, and we continue to serve additional families in our transitional shelter and um, ongoing in our family advocacy. And you all have continued to contribute gift cards for food, um, and gas and other resources so that we can continue to serve our families. And as you can see in some of these pictures, um, they are doing awesome here. Um, and Samantha will talk a little bit more about what else we're doing. But in this time when homeschooling is becoming a big thing, if any of you have children at home, you've had to learn how to be a teacher real fast. Um, luckily, we have an experienced teacher on staff. Um, and so Samantha's time as an elementary school teacher is coming in really handy right now as she works with the school district to kind of create lesson plans and fulfill those lessons plans and make sure all of our kids get ahead in this time. Um, a lot of times we talk about um, one of the programs that Samantha was going to run was our summer program to kind of decrease the summer learning gap that happens for a lot of our low income families. Right now we're closing the gap in this time because a lot of traditional learning is not happening um, because people are still working while their kids are at home. So it's just not as available. And Samantha's helping us close that gap by meeting with our kids four days a week to do academic activities with them and then assigning academic activities for the parents to continue to do. So this is really a great opportunity for our kids um, and the program to continue to thrive. And I'm, I'm so excited that she was here for us. And then we're still doing case management for our families in a time of crisis. So right now we're, we are, normally our first step is into that finance piece. Right now we're taking that into the second level and first addressing the emotional impact. Um, all of us are experiencing different levels of grief in this, and so we're addressing those, those points for our families, making sure that they have the resources to come out of this in the best possible way poss that's, that's possible for them. And so um, we're continuing to foster relationships with landlords, uh, making sure that they do have a place to get into. Even now, we are still housing families. We have, I think, two families that in the next month should find uh, get into their permanent space. And so it's really incredible seeing people continue to work with us. Um, and making sure that our timelines are realistic for them. Um, and then lastly, I wanted to look to the future a little bit. Um, one of the things that I am so proud of for uh, our board and the community um, of Family Promise is that they're not afraid to take risks and not afraid to keep moving forward. Um, one of the things that I think is so important to recognize is that the need for what we do is only going to increase. Um, I, you know, we kind of already adjusted our outlook by hiring Samantha as our children's services coordinator to refocus on the children. And so that's really what we're doing now is we're doing more assessments and planning so that we can resource our children well, um, so that we can continue to evaluate and evolve so that they continue to thrive and succeed. Um, and then we'll continue to follow up with them. So we're really excited about expanding that. And right now we get to do that on a day-to-day -day basis because we see the children every day. And so we're excited to kind of propel into that um, in a forced way, but we're really excited about that. And then growing capacity. We're, the board and myself are still talking about how this will look, um, but what I want to lay out for you, is, these are the number of initial unemployment claims that happen in just California. Um, this is not the nation, this is just California. A and you'll notice um, the leap that happens, right, um, once COVID hits. Those unemployment numbers are gonna directly impact the families that we generally serve, which sometimes are classified as the working poor. Um, those are the ones that if they miss a paycheck or two, they will be without a home. Um, and so as you can see, there are millions of people that are going to be missing a paycheck or two. Um, and so they're going to need housing. And so we are gonna continue to, to operate. We're gonna continue to figure out ways, how can we help families more? I've been in contact with 
about six of the 18 or so cities that we work with saying, how do we partner with you with some of the funds that you've gotten uh, to find housing for families? And so just know that our desire is to continue to serve and to serve even more families as we move forward. Um, but we obviously need your help. Um, and so this is the, um, the sales pitch, if you will. Um, you, I wanna pause first because I always miss this point. The response to our last campaign was so incredible. It blew our expectations out of the water. I think we set a goal for about $10,000 and we raised $30,000 because all of you gave so generously. Um, churches gave, different congregations gave, and individuals and businesses gave way more than we were expecting. So thank you so much. That allowed us to continue not only to operate, but to look to the future in ways that we can serve in even better ways. Um, but we still need monthly donors. And that's really where we kind of build this to a sustainable level where we can continue to dream big. Um, and so, I just did some simple math here to kind of break down what it would look like. Um, right now, our annual budget is 336,000. Um, from that, we expect to get about 80,000 from corporate uh, sponsors and foundational support. And then our congregations in general, uh, it, it kind of ebbs and flows based on the year, but it's about $45,000 that they contribute. So that means that we depend on about 211,000 from individual support. And that happens through a variety of ways. Um, but for us, the way that we can really depend on the giving so that we can plan to grow is on the monthly supporters. And so, um, as you can see there, if we had 350 people commit to $50, $50 a month, we would cover what we needed for the year. Um, and we would know then that we can continue to grow and we can depend on that giving. Um, and so, I just want you to consider it. Consider donating $50 a month and becoming a monthly donor. If you go to our donation page, um, you'll have the opportunity to, collect, to click the monthly button. And that's something that we can then budget in and depend on so that when we do plan our growth, we can depend on that. So I just ask you to consider that. Um, I'll put the link for our donation page in the chat box later on, but, um, but we need everyone. And you know, I really love these little word puzzle things because it just shows that everything fits together um, and it's so necessary. And so I just thank all of you that have committed so many years, so much time, so many hours, so many, nights of, of sleeping with our overnight with our families, making sure that they're okay and they're safe. Um, you've made this possible. Um, what I love to tell other donors or people that are creating grants is we are a volunteer run organization. Yes, we have some paid staff, but without our volunteers, what we do is impossible. So thank you so much. Um, I, I just want to celebrate you. What I love seeing all these faces. I loved everyone's conversation about how do I see more faces? Because that's what this is all about, is the community that exists here at Family Promise to make sure that no matter what, we can continue to serve these families. I know that if I left tomorrow, our families would still be served. And that's the beauty of this community is that it's all based on all of you. And so thank you so much. Um, I am going to hand it over to Lori. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. Um, and Lori, I'm going to mute myself. Are you good to go? Um, I think so. I'm going to try this. Everyone be patient with me. Let me. Can you see it? Yep, you're good to go. Oh my gosh, I did it. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Lori Eastman. Nice to see a lot of familiar faces and a lot of new faces. Um, I am, so I, I'm on the board, but uh, Andrew asked me to talk a little bit about kind of mandated reporting and, and child abuse. So this is going to be a high level overview and um, wanted to, you know, just share some information of what I, what I know, um, what the law says, and as mandated reporters, um, what our process will be and with family promise. So. As I mentioned, I'm a social worker. I've been working with children and families for about 20 years. I've got my master's and um, my license in social work. I've primarily been working in healthcare, but I've got a broad experience working with a variety of community agencies. Um, I'm by no means an expert, but I'm hoping this gives everyone a little bit of insight into child abuse and what your role will be. Couple disclaimers I did want to put out there. 
Um, cause this can be a very delicate subject. Um, so, I, so I did want to say that obviously everything that we do uh, at Family Promise, we do in love and with respect and compassion. Um, and we also just want to keep in mind cultural influences, um, either personal biases uh, that we might uh, bring to the table and to you know, always check those um, when, when working with our families and, and children. So how prevalent is child abuse in Los Angeles? I thought I would start with a general overview. In 2018, we had, well, in LA County, there was about 2.3 million children and there were approximately 226,000 calls to the child abuse hotline. Calls ranged from you know, general neglect, physical abuse, uh, being at risk, emotional abuse. So just wanted to kind of give a high level of uh, in our county what they're seeing. And as child abuse, talking about it can be a delicate subject, I did want to kind of toss out any myths that are out there. Um, sometimes these are questions that we ask ourselves when we are worried about a child or what, you know, they might be going through. So I did want to um, go through a few of them uh, briefly. Myth might be that it's only abuse if it's violent. So remember, physical abuse is just one type of child abuse. There's also neglect, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, and those might not be something that you can see with like your naked eye, so to speak, but you know, they are still uh, forms of abuse. So just because maybe it's not violent doesn't mean that it's something that we don't need to address. Um, there's another myth might be um, most child abusers are strangers. So the fact is that while abuse by strangers does happen, most abuse, unfortunately, is uh, family members or other uh, close members to the family. And then there's a myth that maybe abused children will grow up to be abusers. And, and there is statistics that show that abused children um, could potentially repeat the cycle as adults unconsciously. But there's a, on the other hand, uh, many adult survivors of child abuse have strong motivation to protect children. So we don't want to, to let these myths um, kind of navigate our thinking. Types of abuse that LA County kind of considers abuse, uh, physical abuse, emotional abuse, neglect, abandonment, exploitation, sexual abuse, and then parental substance use um, and abuse. So I'm gonna highlight physical abuse, neglect, and sexual abuse on just some of the things that you might see. Uh, if you have questions about any of the others, you know, after this, I'd be happy to talk with you about it um, or at another time. But I just thought those were the ones kind of highlight. And again, I just want to um, keep in mind our cultural values and also note that just because, you know, someone might be living in poverty or might be poor, that is not considered child abuse or neglect. Um, if the family though is not able to provide or use resources, community resources or resources to care for the child, meaning um, get food on the table or get them to a doctor appointment um, if warranted or it puts the child's safety at risk, then that would be something that might need to be explored. Um, to the child welfare agencies. Any questions? I can't see the little chat thing, but I will try to address any questions that come up. Signs of physical abuse. Physical abuse is defined as non-accidental physical injury to a child caused by a parent, caregiver, or someone responsible for that child, like a guardian. Obvious signs of physical abuse would be, you know, um, things that we can see, bruises, uh, broken bones, black eye. Um, these are injuries that are unexplained. Bruises that may uh, have different coloration, meaning they've been there at different periods of time. 
Other signs might be that they're frightened to go with their parents. Their demeanor might seem scared or anxious or depressed. They may be withdrawn, have changes in sleeping or eating habits. And then they might, they might verbally report that they, they're getting injured by their guardian or a parent or a caregiver. So um, we don't want to ever, um, you know, that's the biggest sign that we can take. Signs of neglect could be they're frequently, the child's frequently absent from school. They could be begging or stealing food or money. They're lacking needed medical care, for example, you know, regular immunizations. Um, they don't have glasses that they need um, or dental care. They're consistently dirty or have a severe body odor, lack sufficient clothing. Um, well, whether appropriate clothing, they may abuse drugs or alcohol themselves. And know that just one of these does not constitute, you know, you, you know usually there are several signs um, of abuse. So, uh, of one of these that would constitute um, abuse or neglect. And then so signs of sexual abuse. Sexual abuse is the victimization of a child um, by sexual activity, including molestation, indecent exposure, rape, incest, things like that. So they might have difficult, difficulty walking or sitting. They may experience bleeding or bruising in their private areas. They may refuse to go to school, have nightmares, uh, bedwetting. They may also experience a change in appetite, run away or run away. They may verbally report it to you. Um, so these are all examples of uh, potential signs of abuse in various categories. And although it's, it's hard to imagine and talk about, um, it's just important that you have an awareness and understanding um, of what these might be. So how can you help? It's normal to feel overwhelmed and confused if you have a suspicion um, that a child may be endangered. Um, it's a, like I mentioned before, it is a very difficult subject. It can be hard to accept, even harder to talk about uh, for both you and even the child. It takes a lot of courage for a child to uh, come to an adult that they feel safe with something like this. So. So the first thing we want to do is avoid denial, remain calm. The second thing we want to do is just, we don't want to interrogate the child. We want to let them explain in their own words what's happened, but we don't want to ask leading questions. Just let them talk, do active listening, um, give them an opportunity to share. While they're doing this, you're reassuring them that they've done nothing wrong, um, that you're taking what they're saying seriously, it's not their fault. You're creating a safe space for them. So the safe, their safety is, um, you know, number one. And that you're going to figure out how to help them. If a child discloses to you any potential um, abuse or neglect or something that you um, are worried about or have a suspicion about, the next step is to call the Department of Children and Family Services. I might refer to it as DCFS here in LA County um, and moving on into if you need to make what they call a report. So a lot of thoughts can go into someone's head when they're thinking about a report. And so I wanted to also kind of put those at rest. Sometimes you might feel that you are going to interfere in someone else's family. You might break up, you know, be the result of breaking up someone's home. You might be worried about confidentiality issues, or you may even think to yourself that what you're saying won't even make a difference. And so just want to lay those aside. Um, and let you know that when you are making a report, it is confidential. You can make it anonymously, but I, I've done both. I've done with my name or, and anonymously. 
um, but they will not reveal your name when they go out to do an investigation with the family. Um, will your report break up someone's home? I can't answer that, but generally when they are doing an investigation, the Department of Children and Family Services, they really try, if, if it's a safe environment to keep the child in the home um, or move the child with a family member, but obviously if it is not safe for the child, they will um, remove the child, provide services for the family, depending upon what they need with the ultimate goal of returning the child back to their family. So I know there, it can be a very scary thing to make a report, but we are here to advocate for children and, um, and this is sometimes something that we have to do. So here, as volunteers and staff of Family Promise, we are all mandated reporters. So if a situation were to come up, and Andrew can jump in at any time or correct me, um, first, our ask would be that you, if the child is safe, escalate any concerns to the site coordinator, and that site coordinator will escalate uh, your concerns to the executive director. We're by no meaning saying not to report, you should, uh, but if before you report it, you could just escalate those concerns to your site coordinator and then to the um, executive director, to Andrew. As I mentioned before, as a mandated reporter, we do have um, rights to confidentiality and immunity. So the reports, as I mentioned, are confidential and mandated reporters uh, have immunity from state criminal or civil liability. So just, it's, um, I always tell my social work team, it's uh, better to report or to call and talk with um, the consultation line than to not report because there are consequences to fail to report and that could be six months in jail or a thousand dollar fine. So the confidentiality line is, or not the confidentiality, the consultation line is great. You can talk with a DCFS social worker, run your concerns by him or her, and they will lead you to next steps. And then bottom line with mandated reporting is to use common sense. We would never ever want to make an intentionally false or malicious report. Um, we, in the next slide, I'll talk about, you know, you have reasonable suspicion, but if you're unsure, just go ahead and, and talk to, to the expert. They are the experts. Um, we are not, um, our role is to not figure out what's going on. We are not to be an, an, the DCFS investigator. Our job is, is to report and, and um, bottom line. So don't ever yeah. feel that, go ahead, Andrew. Oh, no, I was just going to um, interject here that um, we do want to emphasize that we want you to make the report. You know, that first line, your mandated reporters, the escalation is more so that we can internally deal with things within the organization and or walk alongside you in that reporting process because it can be a scary thing. Um, but we don't, if, and this is mainly because I can't act on behalf of all the site coordinators there should never be a situation where a coordinator kind of talks you out of reporting. Um, that's not their role. Um, and I think all of our site coordinators are incredible and great. And I wouldn't think that any of them would do that. But I do just want to make that clear that the escalation isn't so that we decide to report or not. It's so that we know what's going on. Um, yes. And we do see you as a mandated reporter, as a volunteer, no matter whether you're a site coordinator or not. Perfect. Thank you for that clarification. Exactly. Okay, so for reporting to DCFS, there's just one phone number that is um, the 800-540-4000. So as I mentioned before, reporting should be done when a person either knows or has reasonable suspicion, that's the key word, that a child's in danger of abuse or neglect, and reasonable suspicion means that given the same facts and information, most people would suspect abuse. You don't need hard proof, but your reports must be in good faith. So I've made plenty of reports that um, they're, they'll, they'll send me a letter back saying that they were unfounded, that everything was fine. 
I've called and they've told me that there's the things that I'm saying, there's no need for a report. And basically in, in uh, my professional world, we're calling to kind of make sure we've done our due diligence. We don't ever want a child to leave our facility um, without us doing our due diligence. Um, so that's a, why I would rather call and make sure there's no need for report if I have reasonable suspicion. So we're almost done. These last couple of slides, I just wanted to show you um, on the Department of Children and Family Services website. They can walk you. It's a great website. It's got a lot of resources. You can also, it kind of can walk you through the steps. Um, but they've created a couple new workflows. So to reduce confusion, I just say call the 800 number. That's the best way and they'll let you know which workflow you need to worry about. So just know that 800 number. Um, so that was my point there is that sometimes they'll be like, oh, you're supposed to do a couple different things, but the, they will walk you through what you need to do. When you call, they're gonna ask you a couple, well, they ask a lot of questions. So just wanted to share with you some things that they might ask you. Um, They'll ask you for the child or children's name and age and date of birth. It's okay if you do not have all the information, but if you have a um, general idea of how old the child is, that, that's fine. Uh, family's address and phone number, name of mother and father and where they are, current location of the child or children, what language is spoken in the home, Describe the abuse or neglect or, or what your reasonable suspicion is. If you know when this occurred and how often it has occurred and where it occurred is helpful. They'll ask if the child has any injuries and they'll ask you to kind of describe what, if so, where. Does the alleged perpetrator have access to the child and is the child safe? or in immediate danger. So those are just, I wanted you to kind of have a general idea of questions that they will ask. Again, you don't have to have all this information, but they will ask these general questions. And it's okay if you don't have all the information. They'll let you know if they want you to call back with more information, trust me. After you give your report, they're gonna give you a 19 digit number. So have a pen and paper ready to take that number down, and then they're gonna let you know the initial outcome, whether yes, they're gonna um, accept this report, and it will be either an immediate response, meaning that a social worker will be out within 24 hours or within, they'll give you X amount of hours, or uh, within five days. Those are generally the two, um, pieces of information they'll give you, one of those. If this child already has a social worker, a DCFS social worker, they'll let you know that they're gonna pass this information on to the social worker that you've provided. Or they might say, actually, um, we're not gonna take the report, but we're gonna write this down for future reference. Um, so they'll let you know that. The 19 digit number you'll need to put um, Either um, there's an online report, which I'll show you in a minute, or a paper report is the same thing and you need to use that number. That's why I ask you to uh, write that number down because you will have to refer back to it. Okay, now I'm gonna try to show you the form. Nope. Let me, can you see that? Can you nod your head? Uh -huh. No. We see, so keep, we see your PowerPoint still. Oh, you see my PowerPoint. Oh. It's just really small. Oh. Well, I will, I'll tell you what I'll do is um, I will email it out to you, <laughs> the PDF. Um, it's the handwritten copy of the report. So you kind of have an understanding 
of, of what that looks like. But it's on the website too. Everyone can have access to it, but I wanted you to, to know what it looks like, be familiar with it. And then again, um, up on, they call it this, this SCAR form, but don't worry about that. Anyways, again, if you have any questions or you're confused, the website is very easy to follow. You can always refer to it if you have questions. You can get the form there. You can um, submit your report online after you do your phone report. Um, so just wanted to let you know that that is available. And I think that's it. Any, awesome. Thank any you, Lori. Questions? There was one question that um, came through on the chat, um, do, and maybe, I don't know if you know this or not, but are you seeing more calls of abuse during the pandemic or because students are not in school, is there less reporting? So I don't know what your sense has been on that. And I don't know, unfortunately. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions that people have? Um, you can unmute yourself and ask if you would like, um, or you can type it in the chat box either way. Um, hi, I'm Melissa. I actually asked a police officer about that question, whether there have been more reports of child abuse. And he said, fortunately, at this point, there have not. Okay. Yeah, I know everyone's worried because if, if they are getting abused in their home, they are, you know, stuck in their home. So there's not as many community, community members with eyes, you know, on the children. So that's probably why the numbers are, are down right now. I do know that the mental health needs are up. We're seeing a lot more people in the emergency room, especially teenagers um, for depression and drug use, so. And, and that's a good point, Lori. You know, one of the things about Family Promise is our community and neighbor mindset and being a part of the South Bay community. And so when you're home, be aware right if you're hearing things you know i'm gonna a personal story um when i was one of the houses i've lived at another house next to mine had parties sometimes um but i never did anything about it and then one time it was like this much bigger party went later than usual my wife and i both woke up and said should we call the police we decided not to 30 minutes later three people were killed at that house um mm. through, through guns uh, a drive-by gang violence and so when in doubt give it a call um you know, because then the professionals can tell you what to do. And that's something that I, I try to remind myself since that point on is the professionals have so much more experience than I do. Um, so make sure you get it out. But um, any other questions for Lori? Yes. I, I am also a licensed clinical social worker and I have also made reports. I think it would be very important for people that have never done that to have those forms in their files, to know what questions they have to answer, to know all those those last two things you put up there, I have all that information, even though I'm retired now, but I do think that for P and that's pretty overwhelming yeah. to make a report. And um, I'm surprised that people are expected to do that on their own, that they won't have someone with them when that report is made or have someone that they can talk to and kind of get themselves ready. Although I do think you're right. Most usually uh, when you do make a report, they're very, they're not, the people that you talk to are not intimidating, but it's pretty overwhelming. I don't like doing it. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, I will definitely um, get, I already have some things prepared to mail out to everyone because I, I agree it's better to have that information, have an understanding and awareness. It gives you a feeling a little bit of more empowerment, um, kind of maybe hopefully decreases the anxiety of it a little bit. Um, you can always reach out to me. I'm available. Um, I'd be happy to, to help anyone during that sort of very difficult situation. How do, how do people get in touch with you? I'll give you that information too. All right. Great. Thanks, Linda. Mm -hmm. And in the chat box, I'm, I put a website, it's called mandatedreporterca.com. Um, so that is a free option for you to go through about a four hour course. Um, you'll get a certificate of completion. This is something that we're looking at who we need to require to do this as part of our organization because we are mandated reporters and it is a lot. It's a lot to look out for and it's a lot to be aware of. And so um, just be on the lookout for that. If you wanted to go ahead and do this, um, the four hour general certification, 
feel free to do that. And we would really appreciate it if you sent us your completion just so we had that on file because pretty soon um, that might be something that we're looking to require of most of our volunteers, depending on what their roles are. So just be aware of that um, because we do think that, especially as our organization focuses more on the child, um, we need to make sure that we're equipping people well. And that's something that I think everyone on this call is really passionate about. And so we wanna to continue to provide resources that allow you to do that well. So thank you, Linda, for bringing that up. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Anybody? All right. Well, thank right. you, Lori. Thank you guys. Um, yeah, so we'll make sure that you all get her contact information and we will put more resources and links up on our website. Um, and for everyone that's on this call, if you registered, um, I'll make sure to send out a recap email with some of this information. Um, I do want to also, on Lori's behalf, I asked her to make it as short and compact as possible for this time because it's really hard to ask people to sit through a four hour training on Zoom. Um, so she did a great job of compacting a lot of information into a short amount of time. And so if you do feel like I need to know more, then go through the training. It really, it does make you feel so much more confident coming into any situation where you're working with kids. And it really gives you that opportunity to kind of be more open to what's going on. And so, um, yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out, but thank you so much, Lori. Yep, thank you. Thank you, Lori. Thank you, bye. All right, um, we're, we're at the last part of our meeting. We're gonna do a quick poll for everybody. Um, we're gonna be launching into conversations about volunteering. And I know right now that we're limited in what we can do, um, but I did want to uh, throw this poll out to you. So you're gonna see something pop up on your screen if you do have a screen in front of you. Um, and if you could just respond to that. So it's asking, where would you be interested in volunteering in the future? So um, whether it's just driving our families around, being a part of our children's program, being a part of childcare for different opportunities that we have for that, um, family outings or clerical support here at the office, whatever it is, I do think you can select more than one. Um, so if you would like, you can, um, or if you just like, no, I really just wanna do that, um, that would be great. So just go ahead and keep answering that. We are having your data um, kind of, we know who's with what so that um, Samantha will have a way to track and, and, and get you involved once, once she has that. So we'll wait just a minute for you to finish that. All right. Feel free to continue sending through questions, by the way. Like I said, we'll get, we'll get to them. We'll email out answers from questions that we get throughout the course of the rest of this. Um, so feel free to, whether it's about uh, mandated reporting, child abuse, or just the organization as a whole, feel free to send those questions because probably if uh, you have them, other people have them as well. Um, so feel free to send those questions. Um, all right, looks like the majority of people are almost in on their voting. And if you don't want to vote, that's okay as well. Um, I will leave that poll up and I'm actually going to hand it off now to Samantha and she's got a little um, presentation for you guys. Hi everyone. Um, I'm just so glad that despite us not being able to gather in person, we're able to get creative and just come together um, to celebrate and to look forward to everything that's to come for Family Promise. Um, it's been, yeah, truly just incredible that within these past three months, I have felt so much like a part of this family um, through the support of each of you guys, um, and as well as just being around these family members and the children. Um, yeah, I've just been spoiled with so much love from them, um, especially because they're now um, here so often at the office. Um, so yeah, I'm just so glad that now I get to finally put faces to the names um, of those who have the hands and the feet and the heart that love um, on each one of our families so well. Um, and yeah, as Andrew was saying earlier that, yeah, truly if, even though we might be here in the office, um, if we left, our families would still be supported because ultimately it's all the support that you guys are giving to our families that allows for us to do 
our job. Um, so we're just so grateful for you guys. Um, yeah, and so I'm gonna share my screen too. Can you see it? Yep. Okay. All right. So, um, yeah, looking at just these pictures here, um, because of each of you and all the support that you guys have been giving to our families, whether it's through the grocery gift card, they're sending things in for them to do. Um, it's made most of my days look like these pictures um, where, yeah, I just get to be around hugs and smiles and excitement, creativity, and just learning from each other through the joys and more challenging moments um, that this time has just brought up um, for each of our families and especially for our children. Um, yeah, and I just really want you guys to know that with all these smiling faces, um, they're really just are so grateful um, and they recognize how much is being given um, to them through volunteers, through people that they may not be able to see right now. Um, and so I really just want you guys to know that you guys are not forgotten, um, even in the midst of the social distancing. Um, for every grocery gift card, clothing item, for every art supply, book, games, Easter baskets, uh, for every little thing that you guys have done in the past and you guys are still doing, the first thing that has come out of these kids' mouths is, who is this from? Um, they want to know more. Like, who is giving me these things? Like, we're just so grateful. Um, and then immediately after, they want nothing more than to make thank you cards um, to just express their gratitude to you guys. And so, um, although right now they're working on some thank you cards to send out to you, um, in the meantime, they made a little video to express how much you mean to them and how much you have impacted their lives. So um, I'm going to share that with you guys. And some of you guys may have heard of the story from me because I've shared it with you. But uh, to preface this video, it starts off with a story called the starfish story. Um, and I'll talk more about it after the video. But for now, just enjoy this video from our family promise families to you. Once upon a time, there was an old man who used to go to the ocean to do his riding. He had a habit of walking on the beach every morning before he began his work. Early one morning, he was walking along the shore after a big storm had passed and found the vast beach with starfish as far as the eye could see, stretching in both directions. Off in the distance, the old man noticed a small child approaching. As the child walked, they paused every so often. As the child grew closer, the man could see that the child was occasionally bending down to pick up an object and throw it into the sea. The child came closer still, and the man called out, Good morning! May I ask what it is that you are doing? The young child paused, looked up, and replied, Throwing starfish into the ocean. The tide has washed them up onto the beach, and they can't return to the sea by themselves. When the sun gets high, they will die, unless I throw them back into the water. The old man replied, But there must be tens of thousands of starfish on this beach. I'm afraid you won't really be able to make much of a difference. The child went down, picked up yet another starfish, and threw it as far as they could into the ocean. Then the child turned, smiled, and said, I made a difference to that one, and a difference to that one. And that one is me. It's me! It's me! <laughs> that one is me. It's me! Uh -huh. Thank you volunteers for donating food, gift cards, clothing, and toys for us to use. We really appreciate it. Thank you volunteers for giving us donations of food and clothing. 
Thank you, volunteers, for giving us all the stuff that we need and the food, the gifts, and the toys. We really appreciate it very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, volunteers, for giving us all the Easter stuff. These flowers are for you. <laughs> Thank you. What's the title? Time. Oh, no. Sorry. Oh, no. Um, yeah. So, if you can't tell from the video, the kids are... The kids are super excited to make this video for you guys, and they're just extremely grateful for every little thing that you guys have brought in for them, um, as well as they think they they just know that they're really loved. Um, and so, yeah, referencing the story, despite there being tens of thousands of starfish out on the beach, and despite how many starfish the child may not have been able to throw back into the sea, despite the lack of encouraging words that what the child was doing mattered. The child picked up yet another starfish, threw it back into the sea, and it immensely changed the life for that one starfish. And I want each of you guys to know that for every sprinkle of salt that you put on the meat you were cooking, um, for every drive to the store, every bed you set up, every night you spent the night, uh, for every piece of trash you picked up, every second you sat with no one showing up, every ride you offered, every penny you generously gave, every little detail that may have gone unnoticed and unthanked, you have made an immense difference. In the overwhelming numbers of starfish lying out on the beach, you decided to stop, meet it where it was at, pick it up, and care for it as you saw it needed. And so each of you guys volunteers, you guys have been the star throwers for Family Promise of the South Bay. Our staff team constantly stands amazed and in awe at the numbers of volunteers we have supporting us day in and day out, despite us having to be social distanced even. Um, we so recognize that each of you are the ones giving us the means to provide and support and love on our families. So thank you to each of you for constantly saying yes to being there for us staff um, and each of our families time and time again. Each of you guys are truly seen. You guys are so loved and you guys are all greatly, greatly appreciated. So thank you guys so much for being our star throwers. And thank you, Samantha, for sharing that with us. Um, yeah, yeah, I know all of you are jealous now that I get to hang out here with Samantha and the kids. Uh, but thank you so much. Really, the heart of what we wanted to do here um, was to say thank you. We know that we can't do this without you. And so we just really appreciate it. Um, we appreciate all the investment that you've given, um, all the time that you've sacrificed, all the money that you've given. Um, we know it's not easy right now. We know that everyone's in uncertain times. We know that many of you are hurting. Um, we're all experiencing levels of grief. And so thank you for sitting in that with us. Um, and we appreciate you so much. Um, again, if you have any questions for us, feel free to reach out at any time. Um, yeah, we, we, we love you guys so much. Uh, thank you so much. Um, and thank you for taking time tonight to, to get a little bit of training and to just celebrate with us all the incredible things that you have been doing. Um, so that's all we have tonight. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Andrew, for everything that you and the staff have done. It's just been above and beyond uh, the, the change, uh, changes you've made in order to uh, manage the situation. And so we just feel, uh, and you too, Samantha, just uh, you're a blessing to this organization. And um, we're going to keep on we're going to keep on going and and making difference uh, differences just uh, just as you've you've asked us to. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. Everyone have a great night. Stay safe. We'll see you soon. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.